What's up everyone, welcome back to How to Become an Animator. I'm Sir Wade and in today's video, we are going to be talking about parent constraints for animation. Basically, the issue of if you need your character to pick something up, to then be able to release it for someone else to be able to pick it up, there are a lot of different ways to do this, and there's only a few correct ones. We've all struggled with this at one point or another, trying to figure out how best to stick something to a character's hand, or their feet, or their body, or whatever. So in this tutorial, I want to show you some of those different techniques and why some of them are going to be better than others for your type of shot. Now, if you're in a crunch and you just click this video to find out the best method, or you're revisiting this video later and you've already watched all this, the time code for the final best solution for parent constraints is here. Now, if you haven't seen this whole video before, I highly recommend just watching the whole video. I did not make it long to bore you. I promise it's useful information. You'll learn a lot from it and you'll understand what you're doing a lot better so that you don't have to be Googling these answers so much. You'll just know what to do. Now, pretty much everything we're about to cover is going to apply to any 3D application that you may be using. I personally will be using Maya and the entire Maya project file that I'm using here that I've animated, created all this stuff is available to you guys on Patreon. So if you want these project files and you just want to use them, learn from them, do the exercises or just animate with them because they are complete rigs at this point, feel free to head over to the Patreon link here and you can get access to this as well as a ton of other content. So check that out if you're interested. Now with all that covered, let's jump into Maya. Now in my last video, I showed you guys how to create these robotic arms just using parenting, super, super easy, basic rigging without any knowledge of rigging. You can build these kinds of characters. So some things I wanna highlight for you today. There are several different methods that you can use to try and have a character pick something up. Now when most people think of this process, you have two options in mind, either parenting or parenting constraints. Now if we examine these robots here on the left, this is an example of just regular parenting parenting. The benefit to this is that the box can move with the arm and everything looks pretty good. The problem, as you can see there, is that the box cannot be disconnected from the initial robot relationship. So bottom line, you can only connect it to one thing and it will always forever be connected to that one thing. Now, as you watch all these different examples, you may think to yourself, mm, well, that option may not be the best solution, but it's probably fine for what I needed to do. You want to allow yourself the opportunity for your ideas to grow and change. That's very much the same when you're setting up these types of relationships. If you're just doing parenting or parent constraints, if you're doing it a certain way, because it's like, oh, it's probably fine. What happens if your idea changes in the future and you've already done some work? You probably want it to be set up in a way that allows you to be more adaptable to do different things. So you're not fighting against whatever it is you've created or going back, deleting work and remaking it. So bottom line is if you see a method here that's like, oh, that's probably good enough. I recommend that you use the more advanced way. I'm going to show you how to do it. So don't worry about, you know, it being more complicated. I'll teach you. Just know that that's going to allow you more creative freedom if your idea changes and it's going to make it easier on you if you decide to do something a little bit more complex and whatever you've built allows you to do it more easily. So here what we have is an example of a parenting relationship. There's no constraints, it's just parenting. Now it works really well because you can see that the first robot arm is able to grab it and move it around and the box and the arm can both be animated separately is what I'm trying to say. But you cannot turn off the relationship between these two objects. That first robot can never let go of it. And I'll show you some examples of that in a second. So now we come over here to what was set up with the parent constraint. And if you see here, it's the same exact animation, but this time the box is able to detach from the first arm and move over to the second arm. Now, even if you don't have two characters or two hands or whatever, Whatever. the point here is that you can have something grab something and release it and then it can go have another relationship elsewhere. You cannot do that with a parenting relationship and I'd like to show you how that all works. So here I'm going to demonstrate for you two different primary methods of doing this, parenting and parent constraints. Now within parent constraints, there's three different ways to do it, each one more correct than the last. And I'm going to show you very quickly and very simply how each one works and how it can be improved upon until we get to the final best solution that I'll show you how to do for all of your animations. So what I'm going to do is take a cube. I'm going to stretch that cube out and basically make like a seesaw teeter-totter type of thing. And then I'll take a sphere and I'll put that right on top there. I'm going to want this thing to move up in the air and throw the ball off of it. So what I'm going to do is make a few copies so that we can do this a few different ways. I'm going to grab this, I'm going to duplicate it, move it over and use shift D a few times to just mass copy it with transform. Super quick and easy. Now I'm going to grab all these blocks of wood. I'm going to hit S to key them. I'm going to let them just sit there for 10 frames. And then over five frames, I'm going to have them all move up. They're going to sit there for five frames and then they're kind of come down in five frames back to zero. And I'll just key them. They move up to go down. The ball does nothing yet, but that's the whole point of what we're about to do. So first comes our most basic of all relationships, just regular parenting. I'm going to say child, then parent, and say P, or go to edit parent. So now it's going to link the ball to the board. And let's just say that on this frame, the ball, I key it here, it's going to go flying off this direction. So there we go, it up and it flies away. So far so good. However, as soon as the board moves, you'll notice that it's still controlling the ball. One of the benefits of this type of relationship is that the parent and the child can both be animated to do whatever you want. The problem with it is that the child will always have to do whatever the parent does. If you translate it, if you rotate it, if you scale it, 
it doesn't matter, it will always obey, no matter what. So it's not the best option for something like a ball to be thrown from a hand because if someone throws something and then they move their hand, the ball is gonna get pulled with it. For this reason, regular parenting is out. Next is a version of parenting that I used to use when I was a student to try and get around that problem because I didn't know how to do parent constraints either. And I just needed to find a quick solution to just do something, but I didn't know how to do it properly. I'm gonna show you what I used to do in case you do the same, but do not do this as correct either because it's not. So I'm gonna do the same setup. I'm gonna say child parent P, the board goes up. What I used to do is I would go to the frame where the ball was going to then detach, where the object was no longer supposed to be controlled by the parent object. And what I used to do was take the child object, duplicate it, and right now you'll see that if I move it, it's actually still tied to the whole thing. So what I would do is after duplicating it, I would go to edit unparent or shift P. And so now it's no longer attached to the whole system. I would go to one frame before I duplicated the object into existence and I would go to visibility and turn visibility off. So it didn't seem to exist yet. What I would do with the original ball is I would go to the frame right before I did the duplication. I would key visibility on and then on the frame where the other one is appearing, I would turn off the original one. So what happens is it seems like the ball is just sitting there and then you have a new ball, which is the duplicated ball that I would then go and animate. Now you can see here that it looks like it works. You now have a separate ball object, but this is not the correct solution. Do not do what I used to do. There are two primary reasons why this is not good. The first is that if you do any renders, which not everyone does, but if you do render, the motion blur will break this illusion. Because you have one object come in and go away and then another one appear and the motion blur is not gonna sync up. The second and more important thing is that if at any point you make any change to your animation, which let's be real, you're going to make some kind of change and it is a nightmare. Let's just say the plank's gonna go a little bit higher, sink a little bit farther, right there you can see the problem. We now have to move the ball and try to match exactly the same spot. I can't tell you how much time I spent in an orthographic view trying to line up the pixels to make it exact. Because if you don't have it exact, the thing will teleport. So imagine someone's trying to grab a cup or something, and the moment they grab the mug, you know, slightly in a different place, it just teleports a little bit. It's a hassle. If you change it again, you have to do it again. It's just a mess. So it's a method that looks like it works, but it's way more of a headache than it's worth. Trust me, believe me, like I've been there, I've done it a ton of times. Don't do that method. Delete. So you've seen parenting. Now we're here to talk about parent constraints. So let's get into that. Sorry it's taking so long, but it's going to be useful as we move forward and you can see the differences. So let's get into it. Parent constraints are set up in the reverse order than parenting. So if I want to set up a parent constraint at its most basic level between these two objects, I'm going to go instead of child parent, it's now driver driven. This is the driver and this is the driven. Think of it like a driver in a car. You know, this is who's in charge this is who must obey. So you are in charge of you. That's the order of clicking. Make sure you're in the animation menu set because we're going to go up to constrain, create parent constraint. Click the little option box. You can check a few different options here. This box is important because it makes sure that these things stay in their current location. And then you can decide whether you're doing translation and rotation, doesn't matter. We're just gonna say yes. So I could have just gone constraint parent and we would have been good. So if we move forward, you can see it's now attached, so far so good, just like parenting. Now what happens if we move up to the frame, I think it's 15, nothing changes with the board, but if I click on the ball, look over in the channel box, you now can see there's some blue tags on all these translates and rotates. So if I move around here, you can see that the ball is actually receiving the inputs, the location from the motion of the plank. That's what blue means, it's getting an input. Now if I set a key, it turns them from blue to green. That breaks the relationship. Ultimately what you have is the ball was listening to the plank, and then you told the ball to do something else. It gets a little confused of who to listen to, so it just goes with you and it breaks this constraint. Now there's one thing to note here is that when I do set the key, it creates something called blend parent one. Now for those of you in the comments who are about to jump on me and say like, well, you can do it. Like there's a blend parent thing. Like, yes, there are ways to make this work. However, it still does not give you all the functionality that you should have because to reattach it to the same object, there's a lot of reasons why this method is not the right method to use, especially if you're just starting out. So for many reasons, this is not the correct choice. Now we're almost there, only one more to show you before we get to the final solution, but I promise it's gonna be worth it for you to see this. Now this one that I'm about to show you is actually the method that I used for this setup here that you've seen earlier, which is the box moving from one arm to the other. So this is not a bad method, it's just not the perfect method. So here in this next one, here's what we do. If I grab this ball, you can see that the translation manipulation like this whole interface here lives inside the ball, every object has it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sphere and I'm gonna just rename this, let's call this test ball, and then I'll call this thing test board. So these are our test ball test board. I'm gonna say control G or edit group. Now, if I hit the translation key, you'll see that the manipulator is now over here. I don't want that. So I'm going to go to modify center pivot and that puts it back in the middle where it belongs. Now what I've done, in case you're like, what just happened? And you'll see the name is also different. I'm gonna call this test ball group. 
because you'll see if I go to test ball group over in my outliner, which by the way is this button, which I've had active for a little bit, test ball group inside of it is where test ball lives. So if I just click here, it actually grabs test ball, but now on the outside is test ball group. So you may be asking, what was the whole point? Like, why would you do that? Let me show you. We're going to do the driver and driven thing. If I say driver, and then I'm going to, instead of shift clicking the ball, I'm going to control click the test ball group. So it looks like the ball selected, but I'm actually going test board driver, test ball group driven. And I'm going to say constrain parent constraint. You can see that it actually creates a parent constraint within the group. And you'll see people do this with locators as well. I prefer to use a group because I think it just makes it a little bit simpler. And so what happens if we move forward, you'll see that it moves up and moves down just like we would expect. But if I go up here and say on this frame, I want to try animating the ball. This has never worked until now. So if I hit set a key and we move forward a few frames and we move up in this direction, watch this, whoosh, there it goes. Now it's still having an issue, right? Like it's still controlled, like I can't do anything with it here. Here's the beauty of this one. First of all, I set some keys and it didn't break the relationship like in the last one. So, so far that's better. But how do we turn off this relationship? What I'm going to do is I'm gonna to go to the frame right before this is gonna happen. So frame 15 is the frame that I keyed the ball. I'm gonna click on the parent constraint. I can actually click on the group because that's where the constraint lives. You can see there on the test ball group, there are the blue things I showed you where the inputs are coming in. The test ball is not affected by the constraint. It's the group that the ball lives in that is affected by it. So I can either click on test ball group and see over here, there's some stuff, or I can go to the parent constraint itself. And you'll see over in the channel box, you'll see test board W0. Currently it's set to one. One means on, zero means off. So before I've taken control of the ball, the test board constraint is on. Key that, cause that's good. So right click key. We key that as being an active relationship. If we go to frame 15, as of frame 15, one frame later, I'm gonna change the test board constraint to zero, to off, and I'm going to key that. Now, here's the problem, the ball jumps back to its original rest position and then animates, which is no good. Now, what most people do in this situation is they use locators and they, you know, they have it move to one spot and then they have it constrained to another locator and then they go to another locator. And a lot of people have a workflow to work around the fact that it just jumps back to wherever it wants to go. I have a solution that took me years to just realize is one stupid little checkbox that's just sitting there. If you deal with this problem, it's gonna blow your mind. Check this out. I'm gonna click on the parent constraint. Instead of being in the channel box, I'm gonna hit control A and I'm gonna go to the attribute editor. Now you could be doing this instead. You could do all the same stuff we've been doing from this. It's just a different interface. However, if I come over to the attribute editor, you'll see if I have the parent constraint itself selected, there's a constraint attributes dropdown. Click on it and you'll see a little checkbox for some reason on by default that says enable rest position. Turn that sucker off. Now scrub through your animation, it does not jump back to its rest position because you've turned off the rest position. It just turns off the constraint wherever it may be sitting at that moment, and then it takes your animation data and goes from there. So that's great because now for the first time, we have total control over an object that's also intuitive and easy because I can grab this box and I can move it. You know, the ball still has its animation. Now the only reason why this is not the correct method and why we're not stopping here is because what happens if this is somebody's right hand and they're grabbing something and they're throwing it in the air and they have to grab it in the same hand again. This is the exact method that I used when I created these robot arms which proves that you can have it go from one hand to the other. What happens if it needs to go to the same hand? So let's just do this real quick. If I take the ball, it goes up and down. And now I want it to reconstrain back onto that board. Let's just say we make a new constraint. So we're gonna say, you are in charge once again of the group. We're going to go to constrain, parent constraint. That operation just turns it back on. It doesn't create a new separate constraint. It just turns on the old constraint, but in a weird way. So now you can see that it's actually broken from the start. It's now having issues and it's, you know, maybe it's staying here now, but it's broken in the beginning. Okay, we are now with the final method. This is the solution that you've all been waiting for. This is the culmination of everything you've learned so far. This is the correct way to set up a parent constraint to be able to animate a character, picking up, putting down, transferring hand, putting it back in the same hand. Whatever you need to do, you can do it with this method. So here's what we do. We have the board. It's animated already, so that's fine. We're going to take this ball. I'm going to rename it and just say ball example. I'm going to take this board and I'm going to call this board example. I'm going to take the ball and just as we did in the last one, I'm going to go to edit group. So I'm going to group it within itself like we did before. I'm going to call this ball example group. I'm also going to make sure that because the transformation point moves over there, I don't want that. So I'm just going to go modify center pivot so that it's in the correct place. Now I'm going to do something different. All the problems we've had with the previous parent constraints have been one of two things. Either we're constraining something that doesn't allow us to have flexibility to still animate that thing, which is basically why we introduced the group, or constraints can only be turned on and off for an object, and it always refers to the same location on the object that you made the initial constraint. So you can't have it start here and then move over here and reconstrain to the same object. It's an issue of 
one object constraining to another object. So here's what we do to get around that. We're going to create new objects to handle and manage those constraints better by combining some different techniques. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a locator right here. Great locator. I'm gonna hit W, I'm going to move this thing out. Now if you've never messed with a locator before, all it is is this little null object. It's a little just marker. It's a 3D space marker. It actually doesn't do anything. It's just there for you to be able to manipulate however you choose. So here's how I recommend setting up your constraint. Take the locator. Take it to wherever it is that you want to create the constraint, which is here. Now, I think of the locator as a target. It's the location in 3D space where you want this relationship to start. So I'm gonna grab this locator, I'm gonna rename it. I'm going to say board location A, because it is the location on the board where we want this to start, and I might do more than one, so A, B, C, you get the idea. First things first, let's use some of the different techniques we've learned. I'm going to grab the locator as a child and say you, are the child of the parent board, P. So now, as the board moves, the locator moves with it. So if I come to board example and I twirl that down, you can see in the outliner here, we have this locator, which is board location A, and we have ball example group. That's what I wanna do. I wanna say board location A, the locator, driver, control click, ball example group. So driver, driven, locator, group. And I'm gonna say constrain, create parent constraint. So now the ball group is constrained to the locator position, and the locator position is driven by the board because it's parented. So if we move forward, the ball moves up. So far, so good. We get to this frame. I'm gonna take the ball. On this frame, I'm going to set a key on the ball because that's where I wanna start animating it, and maybe five frames later, off it goes. But remember, we still have to turn it off. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go to frame 15. That's where everything's starting. I'm gonna click on the parent constraint, which you can see here is to board location, which is that locator. On frame 15, I'm going to have that on, and on frame 16, where the ball starts to move, I'm gonna say zero, key that to off. Now again, it jumps down to another location. We don't like that. So the Hail Mary of those of you who use this method and have to use a bunch of locators to try and transfer ownership, no more of that. Because again, I just go to control A, I go to the attribute editor and with the parent constraint selected, I go to the constraint attributes tab and I disable enable rest position. By unchecking that, the ball no longer snaps to a weird old location. It just continues on as normal. So then the ball hits the board. Now this is the moment of truth. We have not been able to successfully stick this thing back to the board this entire time. So what we're gonna do is we're going to create one final locator. Let's scale it up so we can see it. I'm gonna move it up here, move it onto the board. Board location B. So I'm going to do take that, shift click the board, P for parent. So now if you look in the outliner, you have board example, which has two children, board location A, board location B. Board location B is the new one we've just created. I can make it a little smaller so it matches. Now the same thing, driver, board location B, control click, ball example group. I'm going to go to constrain, parent, and make sure that we look again at the parent constraint. We need to key this thing. So I'm gonna say on this frame, on, whatever frame was before it. Let's go ahead and turn that off, key it so it's off turns on and again one more thing we're just gonna make sure we say rest position off and also you can take all these um, these locators once you you finish with them and you can just turn off the visibility so that they aren't in your way grab our ball we'll come over here it is constrained to that board it lets go it drops the ball and now did it constrain properly to this board let's find out Yes, it did. Look at that. You can move it down, and now finally we have the ball attached properly, letting go, grabbing, letting go, grabbing, and holding on. This is the full final method to be able to properly constrain something to have whatever combinations you want so that you can have things reattach and attach to different objects and blah, blah, blah. Now, is this complex? Maybe. Maybe it looks really complicated and I've like freaked you out, but like, don't sweat it. You will get there. It just takes a little bit of time to practice with this and get used to it. Now, if you want to get used to this stuff, don't forget, like, if you don't want to set all this up and you want to like play with it, I have the project files for you guys to available on Patreon. So check those out if you want to just download the files I've created here. So that is the perfect final setup. There are obviously tons of different ways that you could be doing this from parenting, parent constraints, and different forms of parent constraints. You can see the different pros and cons of different uses. The more basic you are, the more limited you are. And sometimes you can do some really great work. Like as you see here, this first robot on the left was done only using parenting, the most simple method of all. And there's nothing wrong with it as long as that's all you need it to do. But if you need things to start moving from one object to the other or to be able to go back to the original object, then you need to give yourself that flexibility by building a more complex setup. So hopefully that was helpful. I know that was a lot of information and it took a while to get through, but that's like the whole thing, the comprehensive tutorial that hopefully now, if you watch this once or twice, you should understand exactly how parenting and parent constraints differ, how they work, how to set them up in different ways. There's more to this. This is the basic setup and the complex part of it because it's understanding how it really truly technically works. But if you're going to be using like two-handed swords or really heavy 
objects and like who's in charge of what. We'll get to that in a future video, but for now, hopefully this is enough. Remember that if you wanna download the project files to this, as well as a ton of other access, Q and A's, live demos of software, technical questions answered, uh, real reviews and critiques. If you wanna check any of that type of stuff out, check out the Patreon, here's the link, it's all optional. But if you wanna check that stuff out, there's a video on the page and it explains everything we have going on there. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully this was helpful. And if you know anyone else who could benefit from this information or anyone who's working on a shot with constraints and parenting, and if they're having a hard time, please share this video with them so that everybody can understand all the different ways to do it. And if you don't wanna miss out on more tutorials and more content like this, don't forget to check out the channel and subscribe down below. And if you don't wanna miss any uploads in the future, don't forget to hit the little bell. That way YouTube actually tells you when I upload a new video. But anyways, thanks again for watching. And for those of you who are going to be voting on the next videos, head over to Patreon so you can vote for the next upcoming videos. And I will see you guys in the next video.